Tabriz is located in Iranian Azerbaijan, in the northwest of Iran. The province in which it is located was known for being one of the most progressive ones. The city is held by constitutionalists and is encircled and besieged for four months by Shah's forces. During the time, some leaders of the resistance rose to the rank of national heroes. For example, the defense was organized by Sattar Khan, previously a highwayman. When the defenders were about to give up and flew white flags outside their buildings, he supposedly rode on horseback and tore them down, which led to the fighters resisting the Shah's forces for weeks longer. Another interesting figure from that time period is Howard Baskerville. He was an American who was teaching history in a Presbyterian mission school in Tabriz. As the city became the center of constitutionalist resistance, he joined the defending army and became an officer as he had military training. Baskerville died when leading a counter-offensive trying to unencircle the city. Eventually, when facing the threat of starvation, revolutionaries begin confiscating property of foreigners living in the city. This threatens Russian interests in the region, which is within the zone of Russian influence as dictated by the 1907 treaty. While the situation in Tabriz was getting more and more dramatic and gathering the attention of international media, Russians and British begin urging the Shah to sign a ceasefire and give amnesty to defenders of Tabriz, as they fear for the lives and property of expatriates living in the city. However, defenders are refusing Shah's terms and demanding the constitution to be maintained. Eventually, Russian troops are sent to take over the city, while the Shah then agrees to sign a ceasefire, but it is already too late and Iranian Azerbaijan is occupied by Russian military and Tabriz is captured. Despite numerous losses suffered by the constitutionalists, the tide of war would begin to turn in their favor. From the northeast, an army of Mujahideen is assembled, while in the south, an army of the Bakhtiari clan sides with the constitutionalists. When the two armies are approaching Tehran, the Cossack Brigade joins the constitutionalist forces. Muhammad Ali Shah attempts to surrender and restart the constitution. However, he is forced to abdicate and is sent into exile in Odessa. His 12-year-old son is put on the throne in regency as Ahmad Shah, and the Majlis parliament is restored and elections are called. The period of chaos and civil war caused by Muhammad Ali Shah ends, lasting from 1908 to 1909. As the term of the first Majlis is expired, second elections are called. There were alterations to the electoral law to, in an attempt to make it more democratic. Tehran now only elected 15 officials, down from 60, so it was no longer so badly overrepresented. Some provinces had their member count increased, most importantly Azerbaijan, which as illustrated by the defense of Tabriz was the most progressive province. Likewise, the high income that was required to vote for the members of the first Majlis was reduced 20 times, making it essentially much more democratic. However, despite all those changes suggesting otherwise, the second Majlis was filled with many more aristocrats and less merchants or trade guild members. This could be attributed to the fact that the first Majlis was shunned by many aristocrats, but they sought to be elected for the second one. In any case, the second Majlis was more conservative. Eventually, two parties ended up forming in the Majlis the Democrats and the Moderates. The Democrats were a progressive party, and its program included the transformation of the archaic feudal system into a modern capitalist one, to regulate the relations between the landowner and the worker, secularize the state and centralize it more, ensure the freedom of expression and publication, to allow workers to go on strike, to increase education for women, and also a land reform was discussed. However, the party gradually was filled with reactionaries and monarchists, and few of the forward-thinking ideas were ever close to being implemented. On the other hand, the moderates were a party that was more conservative, emphasized the importance of religion, and was opposed to many policies of the democrats. The moderates held a majority in the second majlis, with the democrats having to make coalitions with smaller parties. During the second majlis, the powers shifted often, and cabinets and prime ministers changed a few times. During the second Majlis, the Shah was still a child and a regent was elected. From 1909 to 1910, the regent was an elder from the Qajar family and not much can be said about him other than that he was an old man and respected by everybody. He died in office. The second regent was Abul Qasem Nasser Ol Molk, who ruled from 1911 to 1914. He was described as an intelligent, Oxford-educated man 
who was in the same class as Gray and Curzon. He was proposed by moderates and Democrats reluctantly backed him with the hopes that he would be able to appease the British since he knew so many affluent people. He was very paranoid and would on many occasions threaten to escape from Persia from fear of his life. In general, he was not up to the task of regent and is criticized a lot. From these personal circumstances, during the constitutional era, regents did not matter much. Finally, to comment on the composition of the Majlis, in the constitution it was required for ministers to be religiously Muslims and ethnically Persian, but the Majlis didn't have such requirements, and so for example a few Christian Armenians were elected. The second Majlis was indecisive and seemed to have failed in a lot of areas where the first Majlis excelled. For example, the freedom of press was to some extent limited, as one newspaper was shut down because it praised pre-Islamic Persia, another because it urged readers to not celebrate a New Year's Eve in protest of the failures of the Prime Minister. Furthermore, the Democrats and moderates started assassinating members of the opposite party by 1910 and the democratic ideals were compromised for a lot of people. Finally, the Majlis was largely compromised in the eyes of the public when it ordered the disarming of Mujahideen who defeated the Shah and made the second Majlis possible in the first place. Now these Mujahideen were armed and turned to illegal activities to sustain themselves. In the tragedy of Atabak Park, Fighting occurred between government forces and Mujahideen, and many Mujahideen were killed while others capitulated and had their weapons confiscated. In this fighting, Sadr Khan, the Mujahideen constitutionalist hero of Tabriz, was wounded, which further undermined the authority of the Majlis. However, I'd like to make it clear that it was foreign influence that caused most of the problems of the Second Majlis, rather than the corruption of local officials. The list of Russian and British actions destabilizing Persia in that time is long, but here are some examples. Russia continued to occupy areas in the north around Tabriz, making excuses for their prolonged presence in effect destabilizing the region. One of the first issues faced by the new government was to obtain a loan because most streams of revenue were blocked during the civil war and little money that came from tariffs was all spent on interests for other loans. Russia and Britain together drafted a proposal for a loan but it carried many prerequisites, an ability by Iranians to employ foreign military advisors, as well as for the money to be spent primarily on things that the British and Russians needed in Iran, railways and armies to protect trade routes. Russia and Britain also blocked Persian government from obtaining a loan from any other source like private banks or German banks. The loan essentially became a political weapon that targeted democracy in Persia. Accepting the loan would reduce Persian autonomy and make it almost a puppet state of the two empires, while refusing it, which was the course of action of the Majlis, meant having to deal with a country on the brink of collapse with very little funds. In another example, an ultimatum was sent by Britain, which threatened to send troops to protect trade routes in the southern parts of the country if the Majlis didn't send an army themselves. The Majlis ended up sending an army to protect the trade routes. Again, this added to the pressure to accept the loan and become a subject of Britain and Russia. So, why were Russia and Britain trying to disestablish the Majlis and empower the Shah? I believe that we need to look no further than the tobacco concessions of 1891. It illustrates how the old system of arbitrary rule led to Shahs gradually selling out their country. On the contrary, the Majlis, while it had its flaws, was largely filled by nationalists and patriots who chiefly wanted a strong and independent Persia, which meant decreasing the foreign influence. This is illustrated by how the Majlis refused to recognize the vague terms of the 1907 convention in which Persia was split into a northern Russian sphere and a southern British sphere, or by how the Majlis refused to take on a loan if it contained fine print conditions that reduced Persian independence. In general, British attitude towards Persia compromises the notion of Western colonizers spreading Western ideals and civilization to uncivilized peoples. In Persia it was quite the contrary. The British Empire was ready to enthrone a king and overthrow a democratically elected parliament, if it meant a slightest increase in profit. But I believe that the Western ideals were not entirely betrayed by the Westerners in the context of the Persian Revolution, and here is where William Morgan Shuster comes in.